My message today is entitled, The Red Letters, What's Really Important. Its text is Luke 14, verses 1 to 14. Now, one of the things I've noticed recently, and I have noticed it, and you probably have too, is the fact that as I go through these messages, a lot of them are really pretty heavy. In a way, it can't be helped. I'm preaching through the words of Jesus in order from the Gospels. And we're nearing the end of Jesus' earthly life. Jesus was having a lot of run-ins with the Pharisees by now. He was teaching life and death lessons with eternal ramifications. There's an intensity and a sense of urgency. The time was short and there was much to be done. And I know as your pastor that these are very important lessons. And while it may seem that we're nearing the end of the series, the truth is we're really not. As a matter of fact, nearly half the book of John is dedicated to that last week of Jesus' earthly life. And we're probably only two-thirds of the way through the rest of the Gospels as well. Again, I know these are very important teachings. And truth be known, once Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, we see a little bit of a shift in the teaching as he begins to really sow into his disciples with some of the most encouraging messages in the Bible, and we're almost there. But I'm also aware that the last thing I want to do is leave you feeling beaten down because at the end of the day, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And while none of us is perfect, I want you to know that I feel blessed to be part of this congregation. You're some of the kindest, most loving people I have ever met. And I know you all strive to be like Jesus. You try to love your neighbor as yourself. I was considering jumping off of this series again for a little while. But we'll do that in a few weeks with the Advent series. And it's going to look a little different this year. I'm calling it, it's the most wonderful time of the year. And I don't mind telling you, it's a different series. And I'm really looking forward to it. For today, though. As I was reading through what would be the next message, the next passage in our Red Letter series, I started to think it looks really encouraging. And so I call this message what's really important. Our text starts in familiar territory. It's a Sabbath near the end of Jesus' earthly life, and there's someone who needs healing. Healing on the Sabbath once again. Verse four, uh, excuse me, chapter 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to, the, to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling in his body. That sounds pretty awful, doesn't it? By now we know this healing will be easy for Jesus. But note that it says the Pharisees were watching carefully. Jesus knows every time he heals on the Sabbath, they accuse him of sin. And he wants these Pharisees, along with all the other people, to leave that hard-heartedness behind. He wants them to see what's really important so they can come to him and be saved. Look at verse 3. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He lays it out as a very simple question, right? He wants an answer. He wants to get to the heart of their heart problem. He wants to help them. He wants to teach them. But they're not interested in that. They're not watching to learn. They're watching to find something they can use against him. Their minds, in a very real way, are made up. So look what happened. Verse 4, but they remain silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Jesus wanted to reach them. But he was not about to let their hard-heartedness to keep him from doing the right thing for this suffering man. That is something for each of us to consider as well. If the people around us are being hard-hearted, we still need to do the right thing. Jesus healed this man. And he sent him on his way. 
He sent him on his way to a better life, a healed life. He sent him away, made whole. But now back to the heart of the matter. You see, Jesus was not letting this go. He wants to show them what's really important. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Now, I know we've had similar passages in this series. The Pharisees object to Jesus doing some good thing, usually healing, on the Sabbath. And Jesus shows them something that seems to be of lesser importance, at least in the case of the ox, that they think nothing of doing on the Sabbath to show them the folly of their thinking. And time and time again, they don't get it. And yes, I know we've been down this road a couple of times in this series already. And yes, I know I promised encouragement for today, and here it is. Take the Pharisees out of it for just a second. If you do that, you'll see what Jesus thinks is really important. Over and above everything else, Jesus makes helping people a priority because people are very important to him. And you, my fellow human being, are a people, a person, which means you, you, you are very important to God. Take that in for a second. Do you know it? Do you believe it down to the very core of your being? You are very important to God. You are loved by God. And if you are in Christ, you are a child of God. Please take this in. You are loved by God. You are blessed and highly favored. Imperfect though you very well may be, you were worth enough to God that he sent his only son to lay down his life for you. He did that so you could receive eternal life so that you can be with him and he can be with you forever. This is what he wants. This is how much he values you. Brothers and sisters, there is tremendous hope in that. That is how much you are worth to God. The Pharisees were looking at the wrong things. They were missing what was really important. And Jesus was giving them the opportunity to see it because he loves them too. I thought it was really interesting how Jesus did this example. How he said if their child or their ox fell into the well, they would certainly rescue it. Now for the life of me, I for the longest time couldn't understand why Jesus would use the ox and the child in the same example. But then it hit me. Now, I'll confess to you, I'm not 100% sure that I'm right here, but I think I might be. I get the ox. An ox is of less value than a person. I'm sorry, but it is. If you would rescue an ox on the Sabbath, helping a person should be a no-brainer. But think about the child. As a parent, if my child or my grandchild were in danger, I would move heaven and earth to help them. They are worth more to me than me. I would not sacrifice my child for someone else, but I would sacrifice myself for my child. Maybe in using the child as someone they would help on the Sabbath, Jesus was trying to show them something they could relate to. Of course, Jesus would heal this man on the Sabbath. He is a child of God. And just as any good parent would move heaven and earth to save their child, God moved heaven and earth to save this man and to save us. Helping a person in great need is us being the hands and feet of God, helping to rescue his children. Friends, you need to know this. God moved heaven and earth and sacrificed his only son because you 
were worth it to him. Be encouraged. As I wrote this, my thoughts went to Matthew 10, where Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Oh, we need this, folks. You are worth more than many sparrows. You are worth so much to God. From here, Jesus started watching the room. Verse 7, when he noticed how the guests picked places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. Let's stop there for a second. Remember, Jesus was at a dinner party of sorts, at the home of a Pharisee. And the guests at that dinner were all jockeying for position. They were trying to gain status by sitting at the most important places at the table, near the important people at the table. And it wasn't just that. Did you ever get caught up in trying to be or to look important? Trying to put yourself in a better position in hopes of gaining some kind of status or reward. Maybe showing off to people so people will value you higher. Hey, look at me. I'm right next to the boss. I'm the most important person in the room. I am the right-hand man. Please tell me. I'm not the only one who ever fell for that. As many of you know, I used to freelance for a licensee of the Ninja Turtles. And when I was freelancing for him, I really fell for this because he had connections to the rich and the famous. Let me tell you, I put up with an awful lot and missed out on a lot of important things because I thought this man could make me important. During that time, I used to drive my loving wife crazy because every time I would see my dad, especially my dad, but others as well, but especially my dad, I would tell him about all the stuff I was doing because I wanted him to think I was important. As I look back on it now, I realize I was being a fool. Listen to the parable Jesus told in response to what he was seeing as the people were battling for importance. Verse 8, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the, the least important place. Think about what this means. What makes us important? It all comes down to identity. It all comes down to knowing who you are, and more than that, knowing who you are in Christ. I was working myself to death to be important. I was trying to get better and better seats at the table. I was trusting in this client to get me more high-profile projects because those things would make me matter. They would make me important. I would run and tell my dad about all the stuff that I was doing in hopes that he would think I was important. But you know what? I think of my own sons. You know what they have to do for me to think that they are important? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. They are important to me simply because of who they are and because of the fact that I love them. That's why they're important. They're of immense importance to me because they're my sons. Sure, I want them to be the best they can be, but they have nothing to prove to me. They're already of immense value. Their identity as my sons makes them important to me. So important that I would lay down my life for them without a second thought. They're not important to me because of what they do. They're important to me because of who they are. And you know what? I'd be willing to bet my dad doesn't need me to do anything for me to be important to him either. I was working myself half to death to gain what I already had. 
because I couldn't see my own worth. So I needed to get a better seat at the table. And if that's how it is with our flawed earthly fathers, imagine you're standing with a perfect God. But there's more. I was trying to get that seat at the table, the one that would make me big and important for the sake of my wife and my sons. But in order for me to try for that seat at the table, I had to sacrifice most of my time with them. And for what? So I could be important in their eyes? Guess what? I already was important to them because I was husband and father. Once again, I was killing myself trying to earn something I already had. And the stuff that I did that felt so insignificant to me, the nine to five that felt like I was accomplishing nothing, was the stuff that helped me to take care of the most important people in my life. And I couldn't see it. Am I the only one? What makes it even worse? I was doing the same thing in my relationship with God. I was ignoring his blessings, trying to grab a better seat. And it was choking the life out of my faith. You see, I even felt like I needed to be important to him. But I was a Christian. Which means that Jesus had already laid down his life for me. And if that's the case, and it is, how much more important could I be? I am a child of God. And so are you. I don't need to become important because I already am. Does anybody need this today? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you understand how valuable you are to God? You didn't earn it. You can earn it. And the good news is you didn't have to. You don't have to earn it because he has given it freely. If you're in Christ, you are a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus. And that is the most important thing you could ever be. So we can cease all the striving and just be for a while, once in a while. Trusting that we are accepted by the one who matters most. But if we're not trying to grab the prominent seat, what should we be doing instead? Look at verse 10. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the guests. Take the lowest place. Start off in the lowest place. Now, I'm not going to lie. That can be hard. We're not really conditioned to want the lowest place. But if we will trust in God and get our identity in Christ, a funny thing happens. We no longer have to strive to be important because we know we are important to the one who matters most. Instead, we strive for something else. We strive to be faithful. And guess what happens? God, the one who made us, makes us important. Folks, I've lived this. When I was trying to be a famous artist, I was banging my head against the wall, being rejected over and over and over again. But then I gave my gift to God. Now I travel all over the country and people pay me to make art. When I was striving to be important, no one wanted to hear what I had to say. But when I trusted God, he opened doors. And now people call me and in many cases pay me to hear what I have to say. And it's so much more important because now, at least when I'm at my best, what I have to say is what God would have me say. When I was trying to be an artist, I was looking for jobs that would get people to buy things that they didn't need. Now I get to tell people about the one who everyone needs and needs the most. It all comes down to one thing. I stopped trying to earn what God has already freely given. And instead, I devote my life to serving him and telling people about the God who gave me everything. Do you get this? Do you know how important you are? And do you know you're important just because you are? 
You are loved by God. You are loved sacrificially. Jesus looked at all these people that were jockeying for position, and he realized they had no idea what made them important. They wanted to be important in the eyes of the world, but folks, the eyes of the world are fickle. Their tastes change like the shifting sand, and that is no place to build a life. Jesus finished his thought this way. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's what it all comes down to. Do we want to be important in the eyes of the world? Or do we want to trust the one who created us to live out the purpose for which we were created? It strikes me that the purpose for which the creator of the universe created you and me is probably pretty important. I choose to trust my creator with my importance and show up faithfully to do what he has placed before me. How about you? One last thought from our Lord. He is finished with the parable about people bucking for importance at a feast, and he gives us a final thought. Luke 14, 12. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Now, does this mean he doesn't want us to spend time with our families? No. Once again, he's talking about importance, and he's talking about who we see as important. If we do what we do, only with people who can pay us back, all we'll ever get is even. But what happens when we give to the people and invite the people that might, we might call or some might call the least of these? The ones without the resources to return the favor. We show them their value to God and to us. We show them that they are important. We help them to see their identity in the Lord. We show them a God who cares by the way we care and a God who loves by the way we love. We help them to see that how they appear to the rest of the world is irrelevant. What matters is that they are accepted by the one who matters most. Now, does the fact that they can't reciprocate the favor mean we will go unrewarded? No, look at verse 14, where God says, Jesus says, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Folks, we can't outgive God. There are always blessings in serving him sooner or later. And when we value what he values, we see what's really important. When we value what he values and who he values, we get at least a glimpse into the mind of Christ. I studied this in the word, but if I want to be honest, I learned it at Haven Camp. For anybody who doesn't know, Haven Camp is a camp that I teach at a couple times a year for adults with developmental disabilities. See, these folks are people a lot of people take for granted, and some folks just ignore or worse. The world often doesn't value them as highly as they should. The first time I went there, I went there thinking I was going to teach them, and hopefully I do. But the truth is, they bless me as much as I bless them, and probably more so. See, their love is unconditional. They're not jockeying for position or trying to be the most important. And when I tell them about Jesus, they believe. In many cases, they have an easier time finding that faith of a little child that Jesus speaks so highly of. I grow every time I go. Folks, God's blessings are real. His love for you is real. You don't need to go out and jockey for position so that you can be important. You don't need to make yourself important because you already are. 
You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. You are part of God's plan for the universe. You are the unique creation of a perfect God. You are important because you are his. He demonstrated your importance by giving his only son for you. Psalm 46.10 reminds us, be still and know that I am God. Another translation says, cease striving and know that I am God. You don't have to try to be important because in Christ you already are. So stop trying to earn what has been freely given. Instead, seek the Lord and be faithful. Look for the people the world sees as unimportant and show them the world is wrong. You are important to God. And that is what's really, really, really important. Amen.